No, man, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy that you're happy to be here. Um, man, if, if God has, has just blessed you somehow and made a difference in your life and maybe uh, uh, brought you back from the brink of hell itself, would you just give him a round of applause, huh? That difference he makes. Amen. That's good. That's good. And we are here to praise and worship him today. We are going to go continue on in our series. The series is called Fear Less, and some of you have been here for the first three weeks of this, and this is the fourth week in it. Fear less. How many of you, I ask every Sunday, would like to fear a little bit less in your life? Yeah, yeah, all of us would. Well, that's what we're talking about again here today. But even more than that, we're talking about fearing less and going, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that in just a second. So grab your Bibles. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, you're welcome to take the one, if there's one in the seat in front of you. Uh, if you don't have one at home, take it home. Let it be a gift from us to you. Um, all of you who have 10 at home, bring them back. Bring them back. Quit stealing, okay? Um, now, uh, grab your Bible. We want you to have your Bible with us so you can circle things and star things and write things down. Grab your notes and a pen, and we'll get ready to roll here in just a second. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, again come so very thankful to you. Um, we, we try to express it in our song. We try to express, express our thankfulness and gratitude uh, by cheering however we can. We ask, though, that you will see our hearts. You'll, you'll hear our hearts. You'll know our hearts. And in there, you will find just how deeply we are in love with you because you loved us first. You loved us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so very much for how you expressed that love to us and that he went to the cross for us. He, he redeemed us there. He bought us, paying for our sin. And we thank you now that we get to spend an eternity in heaven with you. Father, because of that, we ask that that you will move us. The fear will not overcome us, but no, instead we'll be willing to go for you to share with as many people as we can the good news of what you've done in our lives. Thank you so very much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of my favorite TV shows. It began with this. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages. Those of you who know it, you can help me out. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, and then this, to boldly go. Yeah. To boldly go where no man has gone before. To boldly go. I always hear that and be one of those sitting on the couch going, that's me. I want to boldly go. I don't want to sit on the couch the rest of my life. I want to be a boldly goer and do something to boldly go. Well, do you know that you, in fact, have been called by God to boldly go? It's go time. It's go time. We've been talking for three weeks about our fears and why it is that we don't have to live in fear. But at some point, at some point, we have to say, no more fear. I choose to boldly go. I wonder if you will boldly go. I want you to understand there are two groups of people in here today, um, really just two groups of people. There's the one group of people, these are the people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ already. They've received him as their savior. And, and now you are considered a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's to you that he's speaking this to today. I understand there might be another group in here who would say, you know what? Um, that's not me. I have not put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, I do not know him as my savior, but... Let me just say, I'm going to talk to you a little bit later, and I pray, I pray, I pray that today may very well be your day. 
But in the meantime, let me, let me speak here for just a moment about this passage of Scripture that we find in Matthew chapter 28. You can look there in your Bibles, if you will. Starting in verses 16 and on through verse 20, and let me tell you kind of what's happened here. Jesus has already died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And did y'all hear a squeak? Yeah, maybe our sound people can figure that out, okay? It's really a loud squeak going on. So Jesus has already died. He's been buried and he rose again. But at this point now, he tells the disciples, hey, I want you to meet me here because there's something special I want to say to you. And this is the last thing that he says before he himself ascends into heaven. So you know it's got to be important, right? So let's find out what it is. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. But some of them doubted. Let me just pause right there for a second. I understand that maybe even in this room today, some of you are like, man, I, I, I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I, 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 but, but oh, I have doubts, and I struggle sometimes with doubts. If you were going to be honest, you'd be like, uh, I, just, I, want, I want to not have these doubts. I wish I could uh, get rid of these doubts, but I do, to be honest with you, struggle with some of these doubts, okay? But I find it so very interesting that the disciple, the very disciple that we most associate with doubting, do you remember his name? Right, Thomas, Doubting Thomas. The one who said, uh, I just don't know if I can believe until I actually am able to feel in the wounds where, where those nails went in and maybe feel his side. And Jesus goes to him and says, here you go, Thomas. Here you go. But it's the, it's the very disciple that maybe doubted the most that we find out ends up going the furthest with the message. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, Thomas actually went all the way to India with the good news of Jesus Christ. He's credited with bringing Christianity to India. Now, if you look on the map, if you figure it out, that is a really long way, especially way back then, right? Can you imagine What he was looking at probably walked the entire way. It's in the very southern part of India. There's a place called Chennai. And uh, we got to visit there a few years ago. And and at this one particular church, they say this is where he brought Christianity to India. And he gave out the gospel. And then they drove us up to another place on top of a mountain. And they showed you the very spot where he was martyred for his faith. And, but now you think of, of Shania and where that was and where they were and the distance in between and all of the things that had to pop up, all of the fears that had to be along the way. And he traveled there. He walked there. He went that whole distance. The one who, in fact, probably doubted the most, God used, and he went the furthest. He went the furthest. Let's continue on. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And then he says this, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, real quick, I want you to go back and circle a couple things. I have been given all authority, circle the word authority if you will, okay? I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go, make disciples. I want you to circle the word make disciples. I'm going to talk about what that means. And then a little further on, he says, be sure of this, I am with you. I want you to circle the words with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The things I had you circle, those are in fact the reasons that he gives for you and I to go. So he calls us, if you're his disciple, he calls you. He challenges you. He says, boldly go, and here's why. Here's why we are to boldly go. Now, I understand. I understand so many of us, we get so wrapped up and consumed with this world and this life that too often we find ourselves sitting on the couch rather than getting up and boldly going. But maybe, just maybe today, the Lord will be able to stir up inside of us 
this passion, this passion for going and sharing the good news, for going and preaching the good news to those who need to hear it. Now, when I say the word preach, I know automatically, and we see it found in this text a little further on, when I say the word preach, I know automatically a lot of you go, but I'm not a preacher. But I'm not a preacher. Now, how many of you would raise your hand and say, but I'm not a preacher? Yeah, you're not going to do it now. (laughs) But I know that's what so many people are thinking. But you know what preach means? It means to proclaim. It just means to tell, just to share. That's all it means. And by the way, a lot of you are preachers because I've seen your Facebook posts. (laughs) Oh, buddy, you'll preach all day about politics, won't you? But you're a preacher. But you're a preacher. You're a preacher that's been told by Jesus to go boldly, to go boldly. So let's find out. I'm just going to be three things real quick why it is that we should go boldly. The first reason that he gives, number one, go because he said so. Go, why? Because he said so. How how many of you remember those words as a kid, right? Your parents tell you something to do, what do you say? Why? And what do they say? Because I said so. Because I said so. What a terrible answer, huh? Oh, that's so annoying. You never wanted to hear because I said so. It's the worst answer ever until you become a parent. Then it makes all the sense in the world, right? Because I said so. But dad, why? Because I said so. That's all you need to know, because I said so. It's a good enough answer. What are you saying with that? You're saying because I'm your authority. Because I'm your authority. I'm the authority in your life right now, and just because I said so is enough reason because I'm the authority. You see, there are a whole lot of things that that you as a child can't possibly understand at this point in your life. But I'm telling you, I want you to go, and the reason is because I said so. I am your authority. Which brings us to the question, what is your authority in your life? Who or what is your authority in your life? Because whatever it is or whoever it is will determine where you go in life. So that's what your authority does. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. I am the ultimate authority, but we have to ask, what is your authority? What have I made my authority in life? That's a good question. Do you know how to answer that? Somebody in here, if you were honest, you might say, well, I'll tell you what, my authority in life is my job. My job dictates everything about my life. It tells me when I get up, when I go to bed. It tells me how much time I get to spend with my family or not get to spend with my family. It dictates where I move to. It dictates, I mean, we just go on and on. Your job is your authority in life. Now, certainly your job should be a authority in your life. In other words, your boss should be able to say, hey, I need you to come to work, and you do it. But should it be the authority in your life? Okay? Now, somebody else in here might go, well, my authority in life, my friends, my friends. You see, I, I am one of the, I, I want so desperately to be liked, for people to be, include me, to be accepted. And so my friends are my authority, and they can tell me whatever I am to do, and I'm going to do it just so that I can be accepted by them. They are my authority. They'll get me to do things that I don't really even want to do or I know I shouldn't do, but you know what? They're my authority, so I'm going to do them anyway. And, and, and so for some, our friends can be that authority. An addiction. An addiction. An addiction can be an authority in our life. It, it tells us everything about it. It runs our life. It can even tell us whether we're going to go to work or not. It's a higher authority than that. The addiction can consume us. It can take over us. It can, it can or every, every minute, every waking moment, be the authority that we've chosen in our life. It runs our life. Or for some, it might be that, that man or that woman, that guy, that girl, that relationship. And, and it's that relationship that... That's my authority. Don't want to mess that up. Don't want to lose that. I'm going to put that there at the top. Whatever it is, you see, there are so many different things that can take that place of authority in our life. But the question is, the question is, will you let Jesus be 
become that authority. The same one who is an authority over all the heavens and over all the earth, are you willing to say, wait a second now, all these others just run me into the ditch. All these others wreck my life. But now I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to be at that place where you are my authority. You tell me where to go. You tell me what to do. You direct my life, Jesus. My authority. How many of you ever played Simon Says? You ever played Simon Says? How many of you are good at Simon Says? Anybody good at Simon Says? Yeah? No, put your hands up if you're good at Simon Says. You good? All, right, all, all you who, who just put your hands up, uh, we're going to play right quick. Just you, okay? You stand up real quick if you just, uh, all right? <laughs> yeah, the, the few of you who stood up, you're out, okay? It's uh, <laughs> Simon. It's, now, now we, we know Simon Says. We know Simon Says, but have you ever stopped and thought, why do we even care what Simon Says? Why do I feel like i got to do whatever Simon says? Who's Simon anyway? <laughs> Who made Simon boss? But so often we don't even question. We just do it. We just do it. And the same thing goes for so many of us in our life. We, we, we have some authority and we just do it without ever questioning that authority for a second and saying, why have you taken the place in my life above Jesus Christ? Is that authority? When I, uh, when I was younger, I had, I had two sisters. I have an older sister and a younger sister. And my sisters used to love to try to boss me around. They used to love to try to tell me what to do. Anybody else ever have that experience with siblings? Yeah. Yeah, I used to love to tell me what to do. And uh, you know what I would always say? You're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. In other words, you're not my authority. And they'd be like, Bo, take out the trash. No. Bo, take out the trash. No. Bo, take out the trash. You're not the boss of me. Bo, take out the trash. Dad said. Bo takes out the trash. <laughs> Why did Bo take out the trash? Because my authority said. And, 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 and it was this motivation behind that authority. You know what the motivation behind that authority was? Fear. Fear. I was afraid what would happen to me if I didn't take out the trash. It was the fear motivation. And, and now, here's the deal. A lot, a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people who say, I'm following Jesus Christ as my Savior, you're at the fear motivation stage, okay? And you might, you might very well be like, I know he said to do this. I got to do this. What if I don't do it? But, but I wonder today if, if we can move you from the fear motivation to the love motivation. Let me explain this way. These days around my house, Nobody even has to, nobody has to say, Bo, take out the trash. Bo goes and grabs the trash and takes it out when it's full automatically. You know why? You know why? Because of my wife. Is it because of fear? Some of you might think so, but no, no. No, it's not fear. It's not the fear motivation, but you know what? It's the love motivation. When I was younger, I was in the fear motivation. Bo, take out the trash, afraid of dad. Now that I'm older, I automatically take out the trash because I love my wife. I don't, I don't want her getting you know, trash all over her and filthy. I want to do that for her. And so I automatically do it. And the motivation behind that is love. Do I, do I enjoy taking out the trash? Do I, I, I can't wait to get up and take out the trash today. <laughs> no, that's not it at all. Nobody likes to take out the trash, but you know what? I take out the trash because there's the motivation of love behind that. And you, when your authority, your ultimate authority, when Jesus says, hey, hey, go into all the world. Go into all the world. Take the good news. Share the good news. Because all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We go, I know that authority. And I will because of my love for him. Because he said so. Because he said so. The second reason, number two, why is it that we should go boldly? Number two is because somebody's life depends on it. Go because somebody's life 
depends on it. He says, go and make disciples. What does it mean to make a disciple? Make a disciple. It means going and sharing the good news. The very good news that that you received yourself, that somebody was bold enough to come to you with at some point in your life and said, you know what? You need to hear this. You need to know this. You need to find out what Jesus has done for you. You need to receive this. And, and, and your life was changed. Your life was saved because of Jesus Christ and because somebody was bold enough to go to you, to go to you. It might have been a family member. It might have been your mom, grandmom. It might have been a friend. But your life once depended on it, and now somebody in your life depends on you to be that person that boldly goes. Look what it says right here in Mark 16. Let me read it to you. Mark 16, starting in verse 15. I think it's at the bottom of your notes as well. It says, And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Good news? How many of you agree with me that this world really needs some good news right now, huh? Yeah, it does. But do you know you have it? Do you know that you have it? And there are some in your life who are just waiting on you. He says, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be, what's that last word? Whoa, condemned. Condemned, I get asked all the time. Pastor Bo, do you believe in hell? Pastor Bo, do you really believe there's a hell? Absolutely. Absolutely. And let me just say this, whatever you think hell might be, It's probably infinitely worse than you can imagine. How? How in the world? You know what hell is? Hell is the absence of God for eternity. The absence of God for eternity. Listen to this. One of the worst things that God could ever do is give the unregenerate unregenerate heart what it asks for. Think about that for a second. One of the worst things God could ever do is actually give the unregenerate heart what it asks for. Romans chapter 1. It's God saying, okay, okay, here you go. Here you go. I know people say all the time, how could a loving God send somebody to hell? And the answer is God does not send you to hell. Do you know we choose hell? We choose hell. You go, who would choose hell? How could that even begin to make sense? Oh, it certainly does make sense. Let me explain it to you this way. How many of you uh, either have had an addiction, know somebody who has an addiction, maybe it's been somebody in your family who's had an addiction, or maybe know somebody who knows somebody who's had an addiction? So we all know what addiction is. Now, addiction. What happens with somebody who has addiction? Everybody looks at that person. And they see the devastating effects of that addiction in that home and in that family and all the people around them and what they're going through. But you go and you talk to that person who's addicted, what do they say? I'm all right. I got this under control. It's no big deal. I got a handle on this. In other words, they have these chains on them and they're going, I'm all right. I want to hold on to this. Because this is me, and that, it becomes, soon becomes that identity. Now, please understand, this is in a short period of, of their lifespan. Maybe, let's just say 50 to 60 years, okay? But now, can you imagine that addiction or that grip of that sin in their life that has control of them growing without any influence by God now, free to do whatever it wants with that person in their life for an eternity, And tell me there's not a hell. The absence of God. To where that sin has the ability to completely destroy and torment a soul forever and ever and ever. And I even hear sometimes people say, ah, that's not my kind of God. I believe God's a loving God. 
and 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 a loving God would never, never, couldn't, couldn't, hell wouldn't happen. There's no hell. I'll go so far as to say this. Listen carefully. That you, you can't even begin to know the love of God if you don't believe in hell. Let me explain what I mean. Let me explain what I mean by this. Suppose a friend came to you today and said, hey, I just want you to know I paid your bill. And you would say, wow, thank you. What bill? And the level of your thanks would either go up or down regarding what bill, right? In other words, they said, hey, I came and paid your bill. You said, what bill? And they said, your lunch bill. You'd be like, oh, man, thanks. Thanks for lunch. I appreciate that. That's really nice of you. You bought me lunch. Thank you for lunch today. But what if that same friend came and said, hey, I want you to know I paid your bill. And you said, what bill? And they said, your mortgage. <gasps> mortgage? What? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? You paid my mortgage? Nobody's ever done that before for me. And by the way, nobody's ever done that for me before, okay? But, <laughs> oh, nobody's done that before. That's incredible. And you're that much more thankful at their, at their enormous amount of love for you. Wait, wait, wait now. We'll go further. That same friend comes to you and says, hey, I want you to know I paid your bill. And you say, what bill? Your life sentence. Uh, are you kidding me? My life sentence. You know, we'll even go a little further. Your friend comes and says, I, I paid your bill. And you say, what bill? And they said, your life sentence for eternity in hell. And then, then, and only then you get a small taste of the incredible love that God has for you. And here comes the love motivation. He loved us while we were still sinners. So much so that he died for us. And that's the good news, by the way. That's the good news that you have to share, that this world is desperately looking for. And it's so weird, so weird how we get so wrapped up in, in things of this world that we at the moment think are important, but it's really just getting us sidetracked from, from what really matters, right? Don't we do that? And for instance, what are some of the things that, that make you mad in a week, huh? Think about some of the things that just, oh, they get you, they grab you, oh, they make you mad, you stew over them for a couple of hours or maybe even a couple of days. How about this? How many of you uh, get mad when somebody cuts you off in traffic? Come on, come on, fess up. I got a bunch of liars in here, man. I, was like, oh, I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. You get mad when somebody cuts you off in traffic. You know what happened to me just yesterday? Just yesterday. I'm, I'm driving north on 675. And this car whips up uh, past me this direct, on, on this side over here, and it suddenly cuts right in front of me to get over to, to get off in an exit. Just cuts right over, and, and, and I had to slam my brake, and just boom, there they go. And, and you know what? It had a community magnet on the back of it. <laughs> you, you know what I think? I know, I know some, I bet some of you are like, hey, there's a pastor, watch this, watch, watch, let's, let's mess with him, huh? Let's mess with him, so let's see how mad we can get him. You do that, right? Okay. All right, so, or how about this, how many of you get, get mad um, when, when you, you look in front of you and they have 11 items and not 10 <laughs> in the fast lane? Oh, come on. You're, you're their accountant, aren't you? 11, 11. And it's just, even that gets you, oh. Or how about this? How many of you uh, in, in, in the course of a week just, you get so upset, you get so mad when your team loses? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, Julio should have caught that. <laughs> it was pass interference all the way. Falcons got robbed, okay? Anyway, 
But all these things, they get us and we go, oh, and it grabs us and it becomes big and we're upset and we're mad about all these different things. And, and when was the last time I actually got upset because somebody I know is heading to eternity in hell? Chase was a little guy. Man, he was, a little, he was young. He was in a car seat at the time. We were driving up north on I-75, coming back from Florida. And, uh, and it was, it was we we're, were, were sitting there. I was driving, and Kim turns around, and she goes, Chase, what's the matter? And he looked back, and he had these tears in his eyes. Just nothing happened. Then we're just driving on the highway. She said, Chase, what's the matter? Why are you upset? You know, you know what he said, just as a little tiny guy? He said, I'm just thinking about all the people in these other cars who might not know about Jesus. <laughs> and what do we do? We, we, somewhere along the way, we lose that heart of a child and we grow up and we get so consumed with all the trivial things of this world. And we forget what really matters. What if, what if there, 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 there are a couple people in your life who you're it, you're it for them? In fact, I want you to think of two people, two people right now. Just get their names in your mind. The first person uh, is a loved person, a, a loved one of yours. Can you think of a loved one who possibly doesn't know Jesus as their Savior? Can you think of a loved one? Okay. The second person I want you to think of is maybe a not-so-loved one by you. Some person in your life who maybe you don't know them very well. They're, they're somebody you, you just see every day. Uh, maybe it's somebody who you know doesn't like you. A not-so-loved one who possibly needs to know Jesus as their Savior. Two, 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 two names. And let me just say this. If you can't think of anybody who needs to know Jesus as their Savior, you need new friends. I challenge you. Uh, you need new friends. Go somewhere. Go somewhere where we can meet them and come to know them. Go, go somewhere. Find somebody. Talk to somebody. And the answer is simply because somebody's life depends on it. All right. Finally, number three. Why should we boldly go? Number one was because he said so. Number two is because somebody's life depends on it. And finally, the third one is because he is with you. Because he is with you. That's what he said. He said, I'm with you even to the end of this age. He says, be sure of this. Know this. Be sure of this, that I am with you. What difference does that make? That he's with us. It makes all the difference in the world. All the different, if I really, truly believed what he says right here in his word, that he is with me every step of the way, then my, my, the only thing that I can do is say, well, go, have at it. Do, 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 do what you will. Use this person, use this body. If you are with me, I believe that we become bold when our love overwhelms our fear. We become bold when our love finally overwhelms our fear. I know, there could be a lot of fears holding you back. But with Jesus Christ with you, that love will, if you let it, overwhelm that fear. And you'll see yourself as his hands, his feet, the eyes, to see the spot to boldly go and share the good news. I remember the day I almost drowned. I was a, I was a little guy. My parents took me and my sisters and some friends up to the North Georgia mountains to, a, to a, 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 a park called Shooting Creek. 
And there at Shooting Creek, there were some picnic tables, and, 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 and kind of wrapped around the picnic area was this giant creek. And when I say creek, it's really not the best word for it. It's more like a river. Because the water would come rushing over this waterfall and go down in between these, these big boulders that sloped inward. And the water would rush through there. Signs everywhere that were posted with big red letters. Beware, caution, do not play in the water, dangerous water. Stay away from the creek. But we get there and my parents and pointed out the signs to me, Bo, you can't play in this creek, it's dangerous, you see the signs. They went and they sat down and were talking with, with the friends for a little while, got distracted. Ah, dreams, I mean, uh, creeks were my dream, man, they were, they were my life, I was in heaven right there around water, and all, all I ever loved to do was to go and, and flip over rocks and, and see what was under them, and maybe I could find some salamanders, some crawfish, right? So as soon as they were busy talking over there, where do you think I went? Right there to the creek. And it was that, it only took one step, it was that first step in on the face of this steep rock that happened to be slippery and I didn't know it was slippery and I took that step and boom, I was shot out into Shooting Creek. It was deeper than we ever imagined and before you know it, I was in the middle of this creek and the water level was up just under my nose with my foot stuck on a rock below. I couldn't yell. I couldn't do anything. I was just there trying to hold on with that one foot for dear life before I got swept down Shooting Creek. And that's with my eyes and my nose above the water. I, I was able to, to look over to the, to the bank, to the shoreline, and there I saw my dad. And you know what? He just stood there. I don't know what he was thinking. I've thought often about that to this day, what he might have been thinking. Like, good luck with that, son. <laughs> Things about to get cheaper for me. I don't know. But he stood there. But as he stood there, suddenly I saw a flash. She moved at the speed of lightning. It was my mom. <laughs> she didn't hesitate for a moment, whatever fear she might have had about how cold the water was or how unpleasant it would be. No, didn't keep her. She struck out into the water, diving headfirst. In an instant, her arms were around me, and she was able to pull me over to the side, and that's when everybody finally came and started helping us both out. And my mom rescued me from Shooting Creek that day. Why do I tell you that? Her love overcame her fear. And if Jesus is with you, As you look out on the world tomorrow or this week, may you see with his eyes the desperation in the eyes of others. May you go with your hands and your feet. May you boldly go diving in head first to finally, finally deliver the good news to that person who was just waiting waiting on you. It's time we boldly go. Let's bow in a word of prayer. At the beginning of the message, I said there are two groups of people, and I told you the one group that I had something to talk to you about. It's that time. Friend, if you find yourself here today and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Consider this. This might be your last chance. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You've heard the message. You've seen 
the love. God loving you more than you could ever dream or imagine in his son Jesus Christ who went to the cross and it's there he died for your sins, for my sin. So that all we have to do is simply receive it. Nothing you could ever do to earn it, but receive it and know you spend eternity in heaven with him. Please, please, please do that right now, friend. Just right where you sit, quietly in your own mind, pray a prayer, something like this. Say, Jesus, today I believe. I believe you died for me. And right now, the best I know how, I receive you as my Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And be my God and my Savior, my best friend. Friend, when you pray that prayer, you mean it with your heart. The Bible says you can know, you can know you have eternal life. You're his, he's yours forever and ever. Best decision you'll ever make. If you prayed that this morning, and we want to celebrate with you. Let somebody know. Tell somebody. Come talk with me. Come talk with one of the pastors. Tell your friend, the person sitting right next to you. Share with somebody. Put it on your card. Let us, let us uh, send you some stuff about the decision you made. so great that you did that today. Father, I thank you so much for those who made that decision, that choice today. We praise you for that. And Father, right now, as, as followers of you, we ask that, that, that we would be moved off the couch to boldly go this week to those people that you put in our minds today. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, let's give a hand to those who received Christ as our Savior this morning in just that moment, man. It's the best decision you could ever make.